When I was eight years old, my parents started taking in foster children. It was short-term care, which meant these kids usually only stayed with us for a few months while the courts tried to figure out a safe, long-term location for them. Over the next four years or so, I had 12 foster brothers and sisters, usually right around the same age as myself. These children were often severely troubled. They usually were very quiet and barely spoke, but were prone to sporadic tantrums and violent outbreaks. My parents thought that they were good people for doing this, that our house, while imperfect, was still vastly superior to where these kids came from. And that was true, I guess. But I knew, even as a little boy, that my parents were terrible to these kids, that they saw them only as a source of income and not as real people. As a little boy, I could empathize with just how scared, lonely, and disconnected these kids must have felt. But of course, as a little boy, there was little I could do about it. And that brings me to Stephen, the most troubled of them all. We were both 11 years old when he arrived. He was my last foster sibling. I remember the day Stephen arrived at my house. He was small for his age, skinny, he wore very thick glasses and had a long curly mullet. He smelled pretty bad. Of all the kids to come to my house, he appeared the most defeated. I never found out what exactly happened with Stephen's parents or why he was brought into foster care, but it couldn't have been good. He walked into our front hallway and apathetically looked around. I felt bad for him. I really did. So I put a big smile on my face and said, So... You must be Steven. Welcome. He didn't respond. He just slowly looked at me, shrugged, and started walking away. Then my dad spoke up. Hey, you get back here right now. When my son speaks to you, you answer, do you understand? He was putting Steven in his place right from the very beginning. You are nothing in this house compared to our son. Got it? Dad, I told him. Just leave him alone. But Stephen cut me off. No, he's right. I'm sorry. He seemed far wiser than his age. As though he knew this is precisely what he should say to keep my father quiet. He was staring right into my eyes when he said it. I think he was trying to decide if I was for real or not while also showing me that yes, he did understand. Uh, right. It's okay, Stephen. My dad said. His tone lightened a bit. I'll show you to your room, okay? My dad looked at me and shrugged as he walked by. Things didn't get better for Stephen. The next day, I heard my mother screaming at him. He had gone into the family food cupboard. That was a big no-no for our foster children. His food cupboard was full of cheaply bought no-name items that were on sale, but he didn't like anything in there. None of them did. Later, I saw him sitting miserably on the couch. I snuck up and whispered, What did you want? He smiled at me. I was shocked. He actually smiled. Cookies, he said. I love cookies. I snuck down to the family cupboard in the kitchen and grabbed him three. There were tears in his eyes as he ate them. And then I realized, I think this may have been the nicest thing anyone has ever done for him. And that was sad. It was appalling. It was disgusting. I tried hard to protect Stephen for the next couple of weeks. I insisted that he come with us if we went to a family dinner. My parents reluctantly agreed but got him the cheapest thing on the menu. It was still better than a grilled cheese sandwich at home with a babysitter. Paid for by the foster agency, of course. When Stephen's shoes started completely falling apart, I insisted my parents had to buy him a new pair standing right in front of them. I told them something I had heard them say before. Doesn't the foster agency give you an extra $100 a month for clothes and stuff? My parents glared at me in anger, but they gave in. They were the cheapest shoes imaginable, but at least they weren't covered in holes and falling apart. But then, things got weird. I awoke one night in the dark in my bedroom. I could sense that something was in there with me. I looked around, scared in the dark. And then I saw the shadow of a little boy standing right at the foot of my bed. 
Stephen, you know what's in this house, don't you? He whispered. I was groggy. What? What do you mean? I asked. It was so strange to have him in my room like this. I had no idea what he was talking about. I've seen it before. Everywhere I go. It's not safe here. I was completely baffled by this. Why is it not safe? I can stop it for you. I know how. But you can't be here. On Saturday. I can stop it then. You just can't be here. Please. He continued on for a while like this. I didn't really buy any of it. But I wanted to make him happy. All right, Stephen. I eventually said. I'll find a way to be gone by Saturday night. Stephen whispered. Thank you. And snuck away. At first, I chalked all of this up to Stephen finally losing it. He had been through so much. Maybe he was finally losing his mind. But then, I started to sense what he was talking about. I'd hear inhuman breathing sounds coming from between the walls. I'd hear footsteps in the attic in the middle of the night. I'd wake up terrified at 2 a.m. for no apparent reason at all. I felt uncomfortable being alone. Like something was watching me. Maybe Stephen was right. Something was in our house. And maybe he really could stop it. For that Saturday, I arranged to spend the night at my best friend's house. A sleepover. We had spent the night playing video games and eating pizza. Stephen was there when I told my mother about this. He smiled at me when he walked by. I followed him into the living room. I think I know what this is about, I told him. I felt whatever it is you're scared of. It's real, and I'm scared too. What do you plan to do? He was once again fighting tears when he spoke. It's why I went through everything up to now. It turned me into this. To do this. I didn't know what to say. I'm still not sure if I fully believed him or not. But I believed he believed it. And that was good enough for me. Oh, how foolish I was. Just make sure you're not here on Saturday. He said. I remember being at my best friend's house that Saturday night. I remember playing Xbox until late into the evening. I remember wondering, what exactly was Steven up against right now? I remember when I said, Oh, my parents gave me money for pizza, let me grab it. I remember rummaging through my coat pockets. I remember finding a note. I remember looking at it, recognizing that it was Steven's handwriting. I remember reading the short message three times in a row. It was just two quick sentences. You're the only one that was ever nice to me. I didn't want you to be there when the fire started. I knew immediately what that meant. That there was no ghost. That Stephen had set me up. That all his talk of hauntings would make my imagination play tricks on me. I was only 11 years old back then so it wasn't very difficult for him. He just wanted me out of the house because he was going to set my parents' house on fire. He wanted revenge against a world that had always been so hard on him, and this was the only way he knew how to do it. I tried to return home to stop it. I tried my best, but it was too late. My parents died in the blaze. So did Stephen. I was put into foster care shortly after. I remember when my new foster family showed me the food in the family cupboard that I was never supposed to touch. It actually made me laugh out loud before I started to cry. I thought about Stephen then. Those cookies that he liked so much. That we ate together. And then... I thought about setting it all on fire. All of it. <laughs>